Hello and welcome to ERA's webinar, Introduction to Wastewater and Drinking Water Microbiology. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Rebecca Romer and I'm the Market Manager here at ERA. Before I turn it over to Mike Blades, I have just a few housekeeping details. First, all attendees are in listen mode, so if you have a question during Mike's presentation, please type your question in the questions box. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. Questions that do not get answered during the webinar will be posted with answers along with the webinar recording on the ERA website, which is located on the ERA homepage under Resources. A little information about ERA. ERA was established in 1977. We're headquartered in Golden, Colorado, just 10 miles west of Denver. Our facility here in Golden includes more than 25,000 square feet of dedicated laboratory space. ERA is a provider of proficiency testing products and certified reference material to more than 7,000 environmental laboratories in more than 80 countries, and our PT studies include more than 630,000 data points annually. In addition to serving environmental laboratories, we also, also manufacture TOC and conductivity reference materials and calibration standards for pharmaceutical, medical device, and biotech manufacturers. More importantly, in ERA's December newsletter, you can take a quick survey and be entered to win a tie-dyed lab coat. If you're not receiving the ERA newsletter, there's a sign-up page located on our homepage. Our friend Analyte is shown here, and she's responsible for the ERA newsletter that goes out every other month. There are rumors that sometime in the future, Anna Light could be joined by Stan Dard. Today's topic, like our last webinar on control charting, came from a previous webinar's attendee's suggestion of a topic. So if you have an idea for an upcoming webinar, let us know. In 2014, ERA plans to provide at least six webinars, which will be featured in the ERA newsletter. We'd love to hear what you're thinking. It will be great topics to cover in the new year. I want to start by giving a very brief explanation of two key terms, PT, or proficiency testing, and CRM, or certified reference material. Proficiency testing samples are blind standards that involve a group of laboratories or analysts performing the same analyses on the same samples and comparing results. The key requirements of such comparisons are that the samples are homogeneous and stable, and also that the set of samples analyzed are appropriate to test and display similarities and differences in results. These are the samples that need to be reported back to ERA. Certified reference materials, also known as QCs, or quality control standards, are standards of a known value. These materials are homogeneous and stable with respect to one or more specified properties and for which traceability and values of uncertainty at a stated level of confidence are established where applicable. CRMs can be used to check your internal quality control processes and can also be used for demonstrating analyst capability or to troubleshoot instrument or method issues. These do not need to be reported back to ERA. Okay, on to our presenter, Mike Blades. Mike is ERA's organic Organics product line manager and responsible for our organics products line, which includes microbiology and all organics products. A graduate of University of Michigan with a BS in biology, he's worked as a chemist for more than 27 years and has been with ERA for more than 20. Mike will give you a brief introduction to a number of micro microbiology topics today. Thanks, Rebecca. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to ERA's webinar on the introduction to wastewater and drinking water microbiology. Our agenda for today will be to cover six main areas. Initially, we'll look at overview of indicator organisms, overview of regulations, and then NELAX PTs. These three areas are to give you a general understanding of what is the concept of the indicator organism, what regulations use these indicators, and what are the NELAC-defined micro-PTs. We're going to cover the regulations at a very high level uh, with the intent to give you enough information to make a connection to the indicators and the likely PT sample designs. We will then move on to ERA's product design. What is ERA's sample design and why do we make our sample like we do? We'll then move on to evaluation criteria. 
How is ERA required to determine acceptable and unacceptable results? And then our final topic will be to um, your questions. Um, hopefully our presentation will cover a lot of the issues that you may have questions on, but we'll try and get to as many as time will allow. Okay, indicator organisms. So the need to determine the suitability of water for drinking and recreational purposes has long been recognized. Simple and reliable methods for the detection and enumeration of microorganisms is necessary uh, to accomplish that. Pathogens themselves are extremely difficult generally to detect. If you think about the list of pathogens that can be contaminants found in water, um, it's very long. Uh, the pathogens can be difficult to analyze for and would be virtually impossible for your typical drinking water and wastewater lab to monitor for all of the possibilities. Uh, if you think about um, cholera or dysentery or typhoid and all the organisms that are associated with those types of contamination, it would be very difficult to actually specifically determine what was, what was the, um, the contaminant. So to make this process simpler, methods have been developed to look for indicator organisms that are associated with the pathogens. So you're not going to directly look for the cause. You're going to look for something that's frequently associated with it. The methods to do that are designed to be easier to perform and can be completed in relatively short periods of time and the level of expertise in microbiology uh, is lowered. The basic premise of the indicator organism is that in pristine water, you won't find those indicators. But if they are present, it's likely that the water is uh, contaminated from some type of waste source. Many commonly used indicators are defined in operational terms. I'll explain that a little bit more here in a minute and they're taxonomically meaningless. What I mean by this is that we use methods that look for microbes that have specific characteristics and produce specific responses under defined conditions. If you find these, uh, the pathogens may be likely to be present as well. By operational terms, what I mean um, for those of you that are actually doing some micro tests, this will sound familiar to you. Uh, if it grows on amendotype media, or it's fermenting lactose at 35 degrees C and it produces a sheening colony in 24 hours, or if it grows in LTB or BGB and produces acid and gas, or if the organism produces a specific enzyme that causes a chromogenic or a fluorescence reaction. These are what I mean by operational terms. So, and we refer to these as indicator organisms. The ones that you're probably most familiar with are coliforms and fecal streptococci. Um, listed here are indicators that you're most likely to be familiar with. Um, total coliforms, fecal coliforms, Escherichia coli, uh, fecal streptococci, enterococci. I've shown a couple of diagrams here to illustrate that there's a relationship between these uh, indicators. The diagram on the left, in the innermost circle, you'll see E. coli listed. Um, e. coli is actually a specific genus and species that's used as, as an indicator. But you need to keep in mind that it also meets the operational definition for fecal coliform. It grows on MFC media at 44 and a half in 24 hours, and it produces a blue colony. The other thing is it will also grow on M endotype media at 35 degrees C and produce uh, a sheening colony in 24 hours. Therefore, it also meets the definition of total coliforms. The diagram on the right shows a similar relationship. Um, in the innermost circle is Enterococcus faecalis, uh, it's a specific genus and species that's not generally used as a direct indicator, but it is an organism that meets the operational definition of enterococci. 
Uh, growth on MEI auger, 24 hours at 41 degrees C, uh, producing a colony with a blue halo, or in this case, enterococci is also a subcategory of fecal streptococci. Um, growth in azide dextrose broth at 35 degrees C uh, in 24 hours. So it's important to understand that these indicators um, are based on how do they react under certain test conditions. And that is, you know, what kind of defines them. I'm using some examples here. Um, it's, it's not a complete definition. Um, there are other tests that you get responses that um, end up uh, giving you that particular analyte. Um, regulations have been written specifically for the detection of these indicators. So now that we have a basic understanding of what constitutes an indicator organism, what regulations would drive us to use these um, specific indicators? So on the wastewater side, we have the Clean Water Act. Uh, it's the cornerstone of the surface water quality protection in the United States. The statute employs a variety of regulatory and non-regulatory tools to sharply reduce direct pollutant discharges into waterways, finance municipal wastewater treatment facilities, and manage polluted runoff. Within that uh, statute, you have the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, um, established under Section 402 of the Clean Water Act. And as many of you are probably aware, as of 2006, coliforms were added uh, to be one of the analytes under the DMRQA program uh, nationally. So within the Clean Water Act, there are requirements to monitor for specific analytes. Industry using surface water or wastewater dischargers will have permits that define the quality objectives of the discharge. Total coliforms, fecal coliforms, or E. coli are frequently specified in the permits, and they'll require the use of an approved microtest to demonstrate that the permits are being followed. Um, a regulation like this would dictate a PT sample that had what kind of characteristics? Uh, it would need to have target analytes that covered total fecal and E. coli. It would need to be quantitative, and the range for it should approximate uh, some of the permits. A couple of other regulations um, on the uh, Clean Water Act side, the ambient water guidelines. EPA approved test procedures under this uh, rule um, for the following bacteria in protozoa and ambient water, uh, E. coli, enterococci, Cryptosporidium, and Jardia. Another reg, uh, the Beach Act, it amended the Clean Water Act to reduce the risk of disease uh, to users of the nation's recreational waters. These guidelines and act put in place the use of two bacterial indicators of fecal contamination, E. coli and enterococci. Uh, within those acts, or within that specifically the Beach Act, they specified levels for marine and fresh water. Um, I believe the recommended concentration thresholds were 35 for enterococci and 126 for E. coli. That's CFU per 100 mils. So a regulation like this would dictate a PT with what kind of characteristics. Um, it would need to cover E. coli and enterococci, and it would also need to be quantitative. Now on the <clears throat> drinking water side, you have uh, the total coliform rule. Um, all public water systems um, are affected by that rule. The surface water treatment rule, um, systems using surface water and groundwater uh, are affected there. And under this particular rule, you also have heterotrophic plate count analysis being used as a trigger. The long-term two enhanced surface water treatment rule um, is a rule that had to do with evaluating systems that might present higher risk, um, and it ties into microorganisms. Um, the total coliform rule 
uh, was a national primary drinking water reg uh, that went into effect in 1990. The rule set a health goal and a legal limit for the presence of total coliforms in drinking water. The EPA set a MCLG for total coliforms at zero because essentially there have been water disease outbreaks uh, that researchers have found even at very low levels uh, there is some health risk associated with that. Uh, the M MCL levels are based on positive sample tests for total coliforms or for total coliforms in E. coli and for fecal coliforms. Under the surface water treatment rule, water systems may be required to filter their water based on specific tests, uh, one of which is the HPC, and they had an action level specified of at 500 CFU per mil. Now on the LT2 rule, um, the idea was to reduce the risk um, of cryptosporidium and in the water system and try to, trying to figure out exactly what systems might be at greater risk. Um, and they wrote in there the ability, instead of doing the expensive cryptosporidium testing, some labs were allowed to monitor for E. coli to determine whether or not they in fact may, need, may be at risk and would need to implement further treatment for cryptosporidium. So these kind of regulations would dictate um, multiple PT samples that had what kind of characteristics. So for the total coliform rule, since the action levels really are based around are you seeing the targets or are you not? You would need to have a sample that would cover total coliforms, fecal coliforms, and E. coli, and it would need to be qualitative. Under the surface water treatment rule, um, you would need to have a sample for HPCs, and it would need to be quantitative. Um, you also would want to keep in mind that trigger at 500 CFU per mil when you were designing the sample. Um, under the LT2 rule, um, you need to have a target analyte of E. coli, and also it would need to be quantitative. So one other reg I wanted to talk about was the groundwater rule. Um, it established a multiple barriers to protect against bacteria and viruses in drinking water, specifically from groundwater sources. Two of the analytes that were specified in, in the rule were E. coli and enterococci. Uh, the purpose of the rule is to provide for increased protection against microbial pathogens in public water systems that use groundwater sources. They were particularly concerned about groundwater systems that were susceptible to fecal contamination. Systems had to do source water monitoring if the total coliform rule, um, if they had a failure for the total coliform rule. Uh, the source water monitoring for the E. coli and nanorococci uh, were the two indicators that they could use um, to de determine if they had a, a fecal contamination source. So a regulation like this also it would drive the need for an E. coli or an enterococci sample um, quantitatively. So now we're going to get into the NELAC PTs. Um, currently, there are only five samples defined by NELAC. Um, the defining information is located on the fields of proficiency testing tables. Uh, the samples that are defined are a drinking water total fecal and E. coli as presence absence, a drinking water heterotrophic plate count, a drinking water total fecal E. coli as quantitative, and then non-potable water total fecal E. coli as quantitative, and then a non-potable water enterococci as quantitative. The fields of proficiency testing tables are located at TNI's website. Um, they're available for everyone. Um, you can download them to see exactly what I'm, uh, I'm talking about. They define all the specific information for the PT providers to follow for the design of their samples and to evaluate the results of the participants. We'll focus initially on the design here and we'll discuss the evaluation criteria on a later slide. So on the drinking water tables, 
total fecal E. coli is presence absence. It re it's required to be a 10 sample set uh, that contain bacteria that produce results when analyzed kind of as follows. You need to produce positive results for total coliforms, fecal coliforms, and E. coli positive results for total coliforms and negative results for fecal coliforms and E. coli, and negative results for total coliforms, fecal coliforms, and E. coli. The 10 sample set shall be assigned lot numbers and randomly composed of the samples as follows. Two to four of the samples need to contain an aerogenic strain of Escherichia, which will ensure positive results for total coliforms, fecal coliforms, and E. coli when analyzed by any of the U.S. EPA approved methods. Two to four of the samples contain, need to contain an aerogenic strain of Enterobacter species and or other microorganism which will ensure a positive result for total coliforms but a negative result for fecal coliforms and E. coli when analyzed by the U.S. EPA methods. You need to have one to two samples which contain a Pseudomonas species and or other microorganism which will ensure negative results for total fecal coliforms and E. coli when analyzed by any US EPA approved method. And you need to have one to two samples which contain any microorganism which will ensure a negative result for total fecal and E. coli, again when analyzed by US EPA methods. Laboratories analyzing qualitative sample sets for more than one method in a particular study shall obtain a unique 10 sample set for each method reported. So I know that's a real mouthful, but essentially all of that information is defined on those tables, and that's the basic description on how the PT providers need to design the sample at a kind of a high level. Now for the heterotrophic plate count sample. Um, it lists on the tables two separate analytes for HPCs, and they're defined by technology. So what I mean, when you go to the tables, you're going to see HPCs, and in parentheses, it'll say MF, comma, PP. And you're going to see HPCs, in parentheses, MPN. What this means is they have split the heterotrophic plate count sample out into two separate technologies. Methods that are quantitative by membrane filtration or pore plate, and then methods that are quantitative by most probable number techniques. The table also will define a manufacturing range of 5 to 500 CFU per mil or MPN per mil. Also on the drinking water table, you're going to find a total fecal E. coli as quantitative. It will list total coliforms, fecal coliforms, and E. coli defined by two different technologies. So again on the tables you're going to see total coliforms listed once for MF and once for MPN. The fecal coliforms once for MF and once for MPN. And then you're going to see E. coli listed once for MF and one for MPN. Again what this is showing is that the PT provider needs to treat those two analytes differently for each of those technologies. You'll also see the manufacturing range of 20 to 200 CFUs per 100 mils or MPN per 100 mils listed on the tables. That's all you're going to find on the drinking water table. On the non-potable water tables, you're going to see total fecal and E. coli as a quantitative sample. It's going to list out total coliforms, fecal coliforms, and E. coli, and once again, they're going to be defined for two types of technology, MF and MPN for each. And the idea is still being that they are asking the PT providers to treat those as two separate technologies for each of those analytes. You're also going to see listed for that particular sample a manufacturing range defined as 20 to 2400 CFU per 100 mils or MPN per 100 mils. Also on the non-potable water table, you're going to see enterococci quantitative listed. And again, you're going to see 
enterococci listed by two separate technologies, once by MF and once by MPN, and again for the exact same reason. All right, ERA product design. <clears throat> One thing that's not defined on the FOPT tables is the, I guess what we'll call the format um, or design of the sample from the provider. The one thing that is required is the provider must provide a sample that temporarily stops the bacteria from normal function until you're ready to perform your test. All samples, whether they're qualitative or quantitative, must remain static until the customer is ready to perform their test. The organi organisms must be viable when the customer is ready to do the test, and they must provide an equal challenge to all participants. Now, <clears throat> you need to know a few things about bacteria to figure out how the PT provider is going to accomplish this. Um, and its most basic level, bacteria need a few conditions for normal function. They need to have moisture, they need to have nutrients, they need to have appropriate environmental conditions, uh, pH and temperature. Currently there are three different formats available from accredited PT providers. Lyophilized, what I call desiccated, um, and whole volumes. The desiccated, um, that's how I'm describing, if, if you've come across products referred to as vitroids or easy gels, uh, they're not true lyophilized. Uh, they're a controlled dried product, um, and I'm, for the purposes of this discussion, referring to them as desiccated. ERA has chose to provide our samples as a lyophilized preparation, and we've made this decision for a, a variety of reasons. Um, Lyophilization is a well-established technique for the pres preservation of microorganisms. Uh, it maintains uh, the sample integrity, the organism identity over a very long period of time. Um, it is the method of choice uh, for, to the best of my knowledge, all of the recognized national collections. Um, if you get a sample directly from ATCC or NCTC or NCIMB, uh, it's very likely you're going to receive it as a true lyophilized sample, and that really has to do with that it's, it's just the best way to preserve the integrity of the sample over the long run. Um, so the lyophilization process um, essentially removes the moisture from the cell, does it in a way that it does not damage the cell wall or the function of the cell, and then it freezes it. What does that mean? It means that it creates a sample that's very stable over a wide range of temperatures. Um, you have to subject it to very highs or very lows to really have any effect on it. Um, lyophilized samples, um, its, its enemy is moisture, and as long as you keep it dry, it's really going to last a very long time. It gives you the ability to essentially ship it at um, ambient temperatures. Uh, and you can ship it virtually anywhere. Uh, it's convenient um, with you know, no time constraints. Um, you rehydrate it when you're ready to use it. Um, and it has a really easy hydration, rehydration uh, step. Our shipping studies, uh, we've demonstrated stability at ambient temperatures for transit of the sample for uh, seven days for the quantitative um, assayed samples and 14 days for the qualitative samples without having any kind of effect on performance. Uh, so you don't need to pack it on ice. Um, it also, the lyophilization gives you the ability to give an expiration period that's measured in terms of years, um, not months or days. Uh, it's extremely stable. Certified reference samples um, because of this lyophilization, are available at any time frame um, and are available after the close of the study. The CRM samples are actually derived from the PT samples. Um, they have the assigned values and the acceptance intervals that were actually based on the study data. Um, the way we do that is when we produce lots for a study, uh, you produce a lot that's a size large enough to cover the anticipated participation in the study with additional samples 
left over from that exact same batch. So the initial evaluation of the batch is done across that entire batch that's produced and only a fraction of it is sold. The remainder are available and you have the actual study validation limits, all the statistics from the study, um, all of those things are available. Um, you could use those products to perform corrective action or troubleshooting. Um, this is not something that you could have if you went with a product that has a less stable design. Okay, evaluation of data. All of the evaluation criteria that are required to be used by the PT providers are defined on the FOPT tables for each of the samples in the analytes. The evaluations, it depends on the type of analysis, whether it's a qualitative uh, versus a quantitative. The qualitative is evaluated as presence absence, but it's evaluated at two levels the analyte level and the set level. Now the analyte level um, on your data reporting sheet for the uh, drinking water product, the presence absence drinking water product, you're going to have total fecal and E. coli listed for each of the 10 samples in the design. And it's going to be evaluated as acceptable or not acceptable for potentially all 30 of those data points if you choose to report it. And so an evaluation is occurring on that level. On the set level, each of these 10 sample sets, you're going to get an overall evaluation, um, which is going to use the TNI criteria, which is 9 out of 10 correct with no false negatives. So you could potentially analyze the sample for total coliforms for all 10 samples. You could miss one, and you still would have an overall evaluation criteria of acceptable if if what you missed uh, was not a false negative. So on the quantitative, the quantitative is all the enumeration of the, of the actual colonies that form and your count. The NELAC evaluation criteria that's specified on the table for the heterotrophic plate count, it indicates the mean plus or minus two standard deviation, and the mean is a log transformed mean. The source water, it's the mean plus or minus two standard deviations. For the WP wastewater coliforms, it's the mean plus or minus three standard deviations, and for the enterococci, it's the mean plus or minus three standard deviations. So when we evaluate these, all of the analytes and the technologies will be treated uh, separately when evaluated. So earlier when I was talking about how total coliform, for example, is split out into two separate technologies, if you're doing a method that is a membrane filtration method, keep in mind that you report that as total MF and it will be evaluated alongside all the other similar technology data, so membrane filtration. Um, whereas if you're doing a most probable number test for total coliform, it will be treated separately with other similar technologies. Now, all data will be log transformed prior to the calculation of the mean and the standard deviation. Uh, the limit will be established in log and the data evaluated. The data will then be reported back to the participants as the base 10 numbers, not the log values. And it's, it's a long explanation to go into why we do that. And I will save most of that for another day. But the general principle is that, you know, log data or actually micro data tends to have a skewed distribution, meaning you get a lot of low results and not many high results. So since the evaluation criteria is based on the mean plus or minus certain number of standard deviations, you need to try to normalize the data set before you apply the evaluation criteria. So I won't go into a lot of detail. I'll just leave it at that. So now, as I promised, I would like to open it up to questions.
Thanks, Mike, for that great overview. We have our first question here from Lisa out of California. Are regulations usually written with only drinking water or wastewater in mind? From my experience, um, that's generally true. Uh, the regulations are written to specifically support either drinking water or wastewater requirements. They generally don't overlap. Um, but I do often see that they're written to be consistent with each other. So um, hopefully that answers your question. Our next question is from Alan out of New Jersey. Why is it two standard deviations for drinking water and three standard deviations for wastewater? All right. Well, <clears throat> the I guess the quick, easy answer is that uh, within the TNI standard, they specifically dictate um, two and three standard deviations, two for potable water and three for non-potable water. Um, I can tell you from my experience, um, back in the day when the EPA actually was running the studies, um, prior to the PT program actually being privatized, those were the limits that they used. And I do know for some of the chemistry samples that it's actually written into the Federal Register, the evaluation criteria, um, for some parameters, and they supposedly approximate two for drinking water and three for wastewater. Um, I don't know this for a, f a fact, but m my basic understanding is uh, when you're dealing with drinking water, you want to evaluate it more tightly because of health considerations, and for non-potable water, um, that's less critical. Our third question is from Jose out of Florida. Why can you have a false positive but not a false negative for presence absence PTs? Okay. Um, well, I, I wasn't actually there when they developed this criteria, but kind of my understanding of it is that it's all based around the total coliform rule. And if you get a false positive, um, that moves the lab towards implementation of, of the actual reg, not away. Um, so I guess what they're saying is if you make a mistake, um, and you should make it in a direction of protecting public health. If you were to um, get a negative when it was actually a positive, that's a real problem from a health perspective, so that's not allowed. But erring um, in the direction of, uh, you know, thinking it's there when it, it's actually not, um, it's okay because that would just mean if you're making that mistake routinely, then you implement whatever the regulation may happen to be. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Unfortunately, we're out of time. You will receive an email this afternoon with a copy of the presentation as well as details of a special offer and a webinar evaluation. In the meantime, feel free to visit the ERA Facebook page to see some of the ERA employees wearing their tie-dyed lab coats. And you still have an opportunity to take that survey in the December newsletter. Thanks, everyone.